Good morning once again. We identify as Unitarian Universalists. One of the older questions we frequently had to feel was whether we were a Christian religion. I don't know if any of you have had to feel that. I sure have. This is after we've had to feel the question of whether we're a religion at all. But answering either of these questions is not easy, and they might vary between us and among us. Our legacy does indeed grow from Christian beginnings. The earliest Unitarians and Universalists were a next wave of the Protestant Reformation, questioning things like how the Bible should be interpreted, whether Jesus was more than a man or not, and whether a loving God could send any of us to an eternity of pain and damnation. The Massachusetts soil where we took root was a rather unforgiving place for thinkers and skeptics. It was pretty much a Calvinist theocracy. And the interwovenness of church and state lingered in New England for a while, even after the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. These promised that the federal government would stay away from religion. But many religious laws were on the books of the states, and more importantly, religion was supported in many places by a fixed share of municipal taxes. See, we're sort of doing that here with our 150 grand, right? I don't think that's quite the truth. But this was a serious business. In many townships, in Massachusetts in particular, it was a winner-take-all game. Whichever religion had the most folks in town got all of the tax money. And it was pretty untenable as well, as you might guess, and led to fierce interdenominational competition and a tendency towards localization, concentration, and segregation by faith. I think it was not until 1833 when a new Massachusetts constitution split their ties between the local governments and the churches. Our nation was a new venture, and the relation of religion to government took a long time to sort out. In fact, we're still sorting it out. The original constitution mentioned religion only once, and that was to claim that there could be no religious test for holding federal office. The Bill of Rights, which was added a few years later to clarify what this government offered to the citizenry, included the new First Amendment, stating, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and continued, to talk about freedom of the speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and freedom of petition. So there's two clauses about religion here, and they're known as the establishment clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And the free exercise clause. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Pretty simple stuff. The government managed to keep its fingers out of religion, and citizens can freely practice faith of their own choosing. For about 150 years, there was little question about the relationship between religion and federal law. At the start, each state could mess with religion, but eventually they were pulled in under the umbrella of the national constitution. The common understanding that the First Amendment protected the separation of church and state, which are words that never appear in the constitution, went mostly unchallenged until after the Second World War. So it's within some of our, many of our lifetimes. And as is common, political and Cultural change was driven mostly by fear. 
In this case, the enemy was communism and we were vying with the Soviets for control of the world and to protect our democratic way of life. And because the Soviet regime was nominally atheistic, although very few Soviets were, we could do this by emphasizing the roots of our, our roots in the Christian faith. In the 1950s, the national model motto was formally changed from e pluribus unum, from many, one, to in God we trust. And this led to the addition of in God we trust on all of our coinage and paper money. The words under God were added to the Pledge of Allegiance in the 1950s. And I don't really know how they did all this or who did it, but the anti-communist fury drowned out any objections that were forthcoming. The pledge issue finally made it to the Supreme Court in 2004, when a California man sued the schools for requiring his daughter to recite the pledge and the words under God, claiming it violated the Establishment Clause. The court then decided for the schools, but on a technicality, had nothing to do with the freedom of religion or the lack thereof. The grounds were that the man did not have sufficient legal standing because his ex-wife and not he had primary custody of the child in question. How did you guys all handle the pledge? I mean, as a kid, I knew it like everybody else. I don't even know if I knew what the words were. I could just get up there and recite it. But eventually they started to bug me. And for a while I quit saying under God. And then I quit saying the whole damn thing. But that's, <laughs> that was when the 60s came on, the world got rebellious. Um, but it was a little bit of a struggle, a tiny moral victory to not say those words, even though nobody else knew. The new conservative majority court that we have now has become bolder on questions separating church and state. It recently ruled that state funding to private religious schools is permissible and in some circumstances required. It ruled in favor of public high schools who had previously been fired for continuing very public Christian prayer circles on the field with his players. Now these aren't huge decisions, but they're bellwethers of the thinking and direction of the court. And I find this scary. Their narratives suggest that they think the framers of the Constitution and Bill of Rights really intended that the U.S. become a Christian nation and that they have special insight into these matters, probably because they wear robes, I don't know. I call foul. If the founders had wanted the government to privilege certain religious groups or to support religious activity, they probably had the words to have said that. It's interesting how freedom of religion is understood here. While we usually think it is designed to allow rights to individuals, Many of the newer thinkers seem to think it's more about how it should include freedom for religions to follow their own agenda. When a lot of people say there's no freedom of religion here, that means somebody told their church they couldn't do something. And this is where we get to the Christian nationalist movement, which has a huge overlap and recruits from Evangelicals, Pentecostals, Republicans, Trump supporters, you know, all the common suspects. Ground them up. Mm -hmm. The existence of a Christian right wing in America and in American politics is not new. I mean, not long ago, recall the Reagan years and the moral majority movement led by Newt Gingrich. But as much as that was a major social and cultural movement, it wasn't any sort of real political overturn. As Americans, the fact that conservative and deeply religious Christians morph into an interest group should not be surprising. And it is clearly legal and constitutional for them to do so. 
These are ostensibly people who are actively exercising and operating within their rightful and free pursuit of religion. The group provided a basis, this group, the moral majority, provided a basis for the eventual development of things like the Tea Party, and now MAGA Republicans. Again, not to my taste, but not inherently un-American or unconstitutional. But behind or inside or somewhere, a group was reifying with a clear agenda of converting the United States into a Christian nation. There's a huge overlap between these people and America first exceptionalists and white supremacy groups, but these are not identical at all. And the term Christian nationalist is not clearly demarcated. For some liberals, Christian nationalism is anything we disagree with. But it is insidious to know to what I know as American values, which include a rigid separation between religion and government. On the one hand, Christian nationalism can be ideological. A coalition of right-wing leaders claimed recently in a report that where a Christian majority exists, public life should be rooted in Christianity and its moral vision, which should be honored by the state and institutions, both public and private. But Christian nationalism is also rooted in identity as well as ideology, and the belief that Christians should rule, that God granted us dominion over our world. Dominionism, as a, is a movement framed by this idea, and it really is the heart of Christian nationalism. And this idea of mandated by God carries a lot of parallels to what's going on in Israel today, where an awful lot of the Orthodox conservative leadership believe that God deeded this land to the Jews, and nothing humans say should change that. A specific dominionist idea is known as the seven mountain mandate, and it has been growing in ascendancy. Known adherents to this mandate include Paula White, she's the woman who was Trump's spiritual advisor, Ted Cruz's father, Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, Michelle Bachman, the ex Congresswoman from Minnesota, and Tom Parker, who is the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. There are many more, but these are people that are readily identified with the movement. The Seven Mountains represent seven key social institutions, family, church, education, media, the arts, business, and government. Adherent the mandate claim that Christians are called by God to influence and rule each of these mountains, and that fulfilling this mandate, when they do so, they can bring about end times. Now, to me, end times and bringing it about sounds like a pretty bad idea, but it sounds great to them. It is their be all and end all. And the image of seven mountains. It's taken from the book of Revelations, and the whole thing is apocalyptic. Preacher Paula White once claimed that Trump, quote, will play a critical role in Armageddon as the United States stands alongside Israel in the battle against Islam. Those are very harsh words. Fundamentalist Christians will do anything even jump into the ring with Israel if you tell them it will help bring about the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is a huge motive and a concern politics and governments and do a visceral fight of good versus evil for the fate of the church, humanity, and God. More than any other issue or candidate, the abortion issue anchored this movement in recent years. The Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade, 
was a deep source of encouragement and a call to action for Christian nationalists. Their immediate and compelling goal, the removal of abortion rights, had been held unobtainable by a court decision for 50 years. But now, once again, it was within reach. Pent-up frustrations were released with vigor as state after state imposed restrictions on abortion procedures. The evangelicals, Pentecostals, Dominionists, and all others who make up the Christian nationalist group are now emboldened. We hear far more overt Christian rhetoric in public debate and from campaign platforms than ever before. With the Supreme Court leaning in their favor and with the possibility of Trump returning for another term as president, a like-minded Speaker of the House, the future appears bright to them and gloomy for most of the rest of us. The most recent and flag flagrant exposition of Christian nationalism, what led me to talk about this in the first place, came this past month when the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos created during IVF procedures should be considered as children. Unborn children are children, they claimed, regardless of whether or not they are implanted in the womb of a woman. This was a setback for reproductive rights advocates, although we should not be surprised that fetal personhood would be their next target of action. As difficult as this decision is, I'm not here to talk about IVF and what that implies. The true, because the true affront that I feel is found in the words of a separate concurrence prepared by the, the court's chief justice, Mr. Tom Parker. He describes the Alabama Constitution, and this is true, there's no arguing this, already contains a policy to support the sanctity of unborn life and the rights of unborn children. And he contends that this mandate was the basis for the court's action. I quote from him now, it was as if the people of Alabama took what was spoken to the prophet Jeremiah and applied it to every unborn person in the state. And that quote to Jeremiah from God was, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Jeremiah 1.5. He then explained the meaning of the terms, the sanctity of unborn life, in a full-blown Christian exegesis containing multiple passages from Scripture. A state Supreme Court justice basing legal opinions on the world. How entangled in state affairs are his religious convictions? Well, here are a couple of examples. This is quoting from Parker and when we get there, the Bible. But the principle itself that human life is fundamentally distinct from other forms of life and cannot be taken intentionally without justification has deep roots that reach back to the creation of man and then quoting Genesis 127, in the image of God. And then he says, man's creation in God's image is the basis of the general prohibition on the intentional taking of human life. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man his blood should be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Genesis 9, 6. And he goes on. And these are his words still. In summary, the theologically based view of the sanctity of life adopted by the people of Alabama encompasses the following three points. One, God made every person in his image. Two, each person therefore has a value that far exceeds the ability of human beings to calculate. And three, human if cannot be wrongly destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God who views the destruction of his image as an affront to himself. This is true of unborn human life, 
no less than it is of all other human life. And that even before birth, all human beings bear the image of God and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing his glory. That's the end of all quotes. I hear these words and this line of thought, and I'm truly astounded and mortified. The decision that extra uterine embryos are people is shock enough, but explicitly basing the opinion on scripture and the supposed word and mood of God is a travesty on the justice system and on any other kind of reason or logic or principle. Bringing offense to Christian sensibilities might be in bad form in Alabama, but it should not be considered illegal anywhere. These arguments have no place in a court of law and no place in an American government. Now that separation of church and state is not essential or inevitable. Many nations are theocracies where the religious body runs the state and many states are organized with a sanctioned or official church. These arrangements can work and might be consistent with local cultural values and expectations. Our nation, though, was formed in good part from dissenting religious groups, people leaving autocratic nations often to avoid discrimination or religious conflict. Our decisions that the ruling government should be defined and maintained as a secular order was deliberate and explicit as written into our Bill of Rights. Yet almost all of these founding religious groups, oh, I'm sorry, yes, almost all these founding groups were Christian, and the U.S. has historically presented as a largely Christian nation. But the word Christian is, a, is an umbrella that covers many beliefs and many ecclesiastical structures. American Christians are by no means a monolithic or homogenous group, and I can't see any group of largely white Christian nationalists speaking for anybody but the few among their ranks. Christian Christianity in America, like most religious organizations, is bleeding adherence. Our churches are shrinking. And the unaffiliated or nuns are numerically ascending rapidly. In some ways, it feels as if the current assault on government by the religious right is a desperate attempt, a last ditch effort to stay relevant and be important. Well, that's my hope at least, but not one we can count on. We must remain vigilant to assaults from religion just as we are vigilant about assaults on religious groups and members of religious groups. There are many watchdog organizations that work actively to monitor religious incursions into our secular lives and who maintain a strong legal capacity and expertise and that will bring cases to trial. Just to name a few, the American Civil Liberties Union works to protect all individual rights, including religious freedoms. The American Humanist Association, the Freedom From Religious Foundation, and the American Atheists each actively fight religious incursion. And this is just a hint of who is out there. And this list is definitely affected by my own personal exposure to the organizations. I'm sure there are many others. But the opposition is formidable. The religious right is traditionally well organized and commands many resources and a demonstrated willingness to build coalitions with others who oppose the left wing side of America. Recently, the right to life movement, the gun right lobby, MAGA folks, traditional corporate business interests, and many others have been willing to work together politically and these groups would readily make space for the Christian nationalists, as they seemed to do for the white nationalists. Our politics mate for strange bedfellows, and as Alabama Chief Justice Tom Parker shows, 
Activists from the right will keep pushing the boundaries between church and state. As long as they go unchallenged for their actions, they will continue to do so. I think Tom Barker should be disbarred, but I doubt Alabamans would agree. But there is good news as well, I think. Just this week, the Public Research, the Public Religion Research Institute reported from a very large survey that two-thirds of Americans disagree that Chris, being Christian is an important part of being truly American. 70% completely disagree that the United States government should declare America a Christian nation. And three quarters disagree that God called Christians to exercise dominion over American society. And I say I think this is good news because that still leaves a third to a quarter that don't disagree with these statements. But it's worth knowing that the majority of Americans did not show any pull towards Christian nationalist ideas and we're not eager to bring religion directly into government. Our job is to keep these issues alive and salient in people's eyes. We know that the extremists vote in large numbers, so our job is to keep the issues before us and use them to motivate voting by persons who don't necessarily connect human rights to religion. The Dobbs decision did this for us in the last midterm elections. It mobilized many new voters, especially women, against the Republicans. One optimist, Linda Greenhouse, wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times titled, Let's Thank the Alabama Supreme Court, implying that the embryo decision and Justice Parker's rhetoric have awakened the American public finally to the peril of the theocratic future towards which the nation had been hurtling. So, a wake-up call. For all of us who wish for women to regain control over their reproductive rights, for all who feel that our job on earth is other than to build a dominion of man in the name of God, for all who wish to decide what to believe and how to go about it, wake up. Whatever you believe, speak your mind, vote your conscience. Your vote, your voice might just make a difference the next time around. Amen. Blessed be. I think we're to you, Gene. Yeah. No.